Now we come to Carl Jung, another psychoanalytic theorist, not really somebody engaged in research. And I'll emphasize Freud did not do research. Freud just theorized. Other people did research as a result of Freud. He was a, had a profound impact on society. You're familiar with some of his terminology and you're familiar with some of his concepts just by being a member of our society. And if you look, go, go to the uh, magazine rack at any checkout counter and you'll see things like sex surveys and how to be better in bed and all kinds of things that are just kind of old hat and nobody you know, bats an eye at, but those things didn't happen when he first brought up these concepts. In some ways he freed us up to talk about sexuality in ways that we now take to be commonplace but weren't. So he shook, he shook up society and shook up science. Carl Jung is another theorist and he used to be a partner of uh, Freud early on. So Freud actually named him his crown prince successor if that gives you any indication of Freud's own narcissism and ego right, that he could name a crown prince successor, clearly became famous in his own time, as did Jung. And Carl Jung would agree with Freud on a number of things, but eventually he deviated from Freud in a way that Freud couldn't tolerate. And Freud apparently did not play well with others. And if you didn't go along with his theories as he thought they should be uh, advanced, then he didn't work with you anymore. So he went from uh, a colleague he thought was going to be his crown prince successor to rejecting Carl Jung outright and never having any associations with him further after Carl deviated too far from him and his theory. And Carl thought he put too much emphasis on sexuality and not enough emphasis on spirituality, which is an interesting take on it. So his ideas were that, yeah, we have a personal unconscious. He agreed with Freud, you know, there's this massive force within us that drives our behavior that we're unaware of and unable to appreciate, examine, and probably alter because we're unable to be conscious of it. But then he said further, we have a collective unconscious that we all share. And of course, these are constructs within your personality. And we share this collective unconscious because we're all human beings. As human beings, we are going to be uh, influenced by our own genetic history in the sense that we have come down through the ages with certain concepts that no matter where you're born as a human being, you will share those concepts so that we don't get away from being human no matter what our cultural influences are. And one thing that Jung had done that Freud had not done is he had traveled and he had examined other cultures and he noticed that there's commonalities no matter how disparate these cultures were in terms of societal practices or beliefs he noticed that they all had theories of good and evil that they all had creation stories how we came to be that they all had hierarchies and organizations they all shared certain characteristics but expressed them differently and that those expressions could be traced back to some very common archetypes. The archetypes are symbols, thoughts with universal meaning to all human beings. So we have our wise old man archetype. We have our motherly old woman, nurturing woman archetype. Uh, those things have been played out since Greek dramas. If you look at all of the dramas and the tragedies and the comedies going all the way back to the pre-Socratic philosophers, you'll find that the themes that we see in television and movies today are the same themes. We're just rewriting the characters and the details, but the themes remain the same. You look at Star Wars and you've got Yoda, the wise old man. You've got evil incarnate and Darth Vader, but a conflicted evil because he's also Luke Skywalker's dad. Well, Luke Skywalker's the, the young hero who has to save the damsel in distress. And that no matter how you express it, whether it's CSI or whether it's uh, Shakespeare, that you're seeing the same theme being repeated over and over and over because it's who we are. Why do people want to see the same story again and again and again? Week after week, all we're doing is changing a little plot, changing a little character, but the core symbols, the core universal archetypes, the good versus the evil, the overcoming obstacles, these stories that we find so inspiring are us. They're who we are, such that from the point of view of the archetypal human, if you could theoretically take a group of babies and somehow magically transport them over to a, a new planet and they had zero influence from adults and they could be raised, of course that's impossible, but assuming that you could do that for hypothetical purposes, what you would find from Jung's point of view is they would tap into the collective unconscious and they would develop a story about how they were created and came to be in that space. They would develop 
concepts of good and evil. They would develop organizational hierarchies for society and they would ascribe to the archetypes. They would have very similar themes regardless because they're humans and we share that. And then that influences us each individually as people, what we identify with, what we don't identify with, what we are drawn to or repulsed by, etc. And the unconscious that we all have individually, he acknowledged, but he went beyond that. And again, um, this is into a more spiritual realm of human existence, not supported necessarily in any way by science. And keep in mind, science is what we are as uh, psychology. We're talking about historical perspectives here. Philosophically, these are pretty fascinating concepts, very hard to operationalize and test scientifically. So in that sense, we just look at this as one of the big launching points of personality uh, research. And then we have, finally for Carl Jung, introvert and extrovert. Now this concept goes all the way back to Aristotle and probably beyond that. The idea that there are people who are more individually and shy and, and reticent to engage in lots of social interaction and other people who just can't seem to get enough social interaction. They crave it, they seek it, they want it. Right? So the introvert then from, from this point of view being developed further by Carl Jung is the person who's just preoccupied with the inner world. Inside their unconscious or their conscious self they are experiencing thoughts, feelings, emotions that they are fascinated by. Uh, the concepts that they are interested in, they might find uh, it very fulfilling to read books or to watch movies alone or to uh, you know, engage in solitary activities like puzzles or hobbies or music or things like that where they just find great gratification in that. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just a way of being that Young thought was attributable to being preoccupied with an inner world where the extroverted person would be more preoccupied with the external world, the people, the experiences that one can have in the world and that they would seek that out because that's stimulating and gratifying to them. Not wrong, not bad, just that's the predominant drive is to go out and to interact with the world where the other person's predominant drive is to withdraw and to ex uh, expand on what they can do by themselves. And so you look at this and we'll see that through when we get to trait theory, there's a thread that gets continued all the way through until we get up to the big five personality factors. Thank you and you have a good day. It looks like everybody's arguing. You got all these competing theories. If you take a personality class, in other words, an actual upper level psych class on personality, you take a semester's long course and find out nobody's got it nailed down. You look at all those theorists we saw with intelligence and people like to think, well, I know what intelligence is. Well, from a layperson's perspective, you may know what you think intelligence is, but when you get into the scientific side of things, it's debatable and empirically debatable. And of course, that's the kind of debate we want to be having is what holds up to scrutiny? And Freud had a wealth of information. We take it with a big grain of salt because a lot of it was not operationalizable. You couldn't actually put it into terms or variables that could be measured such that it could be refuted or supported. Some of the stuff that he contributed still is with us today because it does have empirical support and it stood the test of time. But back in his day, he was one of the first people to even start to posit a full comprehensive theory of how people come to be an identity. Who are you? How do other people know you? How do they describe you? What happens inside of yourself as you go through the development process that you come to a point where you have a self-image, a self-view, a concept of you as a discreet and unique person compared to all the other discreet and unique persons in our race, the human race, right? There's so many of us and we share so much genetically in terms of how we live as biological entities, but on the other side, every one of us is really unique in some way. And so that being possibly who you are as a personality, he started to theorize, but not everybody agreed with him. He was relatively controversial. I wouldn't even say relatively, he was extremely controversial. And people started to do research to either refute him or support him. And you see that certain people who aligned with him, modified his views. He didn't care for that. He didn't like Carl Jung modifying his views. He stopped all professional interaction with Carl Jung. Called him his crown prince successor, if that gives you any hint as to Freud's view of himself. Who names their own crown prince successor, right? But after he kind of deviated on some key concepts, wouldn't have anything to do with him. But you look at his 
theory and you say, well, gosh, that's really misogynistic. It's very unfavorable to women and it's patriarchal and it's a little oppressive at the very least and very oppressive at the very most. It certainly was geared to find what he assumed was the case. That men had superiority and women were inferior to men and that was just the way it was and that was about penis envy that women saw that men had this appendage that they lacked and they wished they had it and you go through the Oedipus complex and the Electric complex and you resolve all of these things and then you find yourself socializing into roles through sublimation. And other people came along and challenged those notions. And one, being a psychoanalytic female, and what is probably the most ironic of all pronunciations, Karen Horney is how I'm told it's pronounced. It looks like horny to me, and a lot of his stuff was based on sexuality. Not the kind of sexuality that most people think about when they're thinking tabloid magazines. Talk about reproduction of the species and drives internal to ourselves that are so primitive and base and animalistic that we don't even like to acknowledge that they exist. And so we deny that they exist. We repress them and we push them down into the unconscious, but he says they're still there and they still move us every day in everything we do. We're just not aware of it. So for him, it's a deterministic world. You go through your childhood, you get your experiences which load you up on various kinds of fixations and compulsions and issues and neuroses, and then you're fixed that way. If you remember we talked about uh, Adler looking at the, the uh, or excuse me, Erickson, Eric Erickson's stages of development where he took the first five and they mapped onto the ones Kyle told you about the other day. Freud's five psychosexual stages of development. But he said you don't stop developing in your late teens, you keep developing throughout life. That's where Erickson modified Freud. Anna Freud, his daughter modified Freud and came up with child psychoanalysis. And Karen Horney was a psychoanalytic therapist and researcher and theorist. And she didn't throw all of Freud out. She in fact thought Freud was onto something and wanted to amend it. And one of the, I guess, most classic things that she did was when she was looking at Freudian psychoanalysis and this thing of penis envy and this idea of male dominance being kind of culturally ordained because it was somehow the natural order of things, she flipped it on its head. She said, women don't want penises. They don't have an issue where they think that they're missing and they got gypped on the appendage, right? What happens with male dominance and male uh, patriarchy is that women have power. They have the power of life. They have the womb. You don't need a man but for a second to create a life, but you need a woman to bring it to term and raise it up. And she said, that's the real power. What's the ultimate power in this world? Creation of another life. And women had the primary ability and responsibility to do it, and men being jealous of their power then subjugated them physically and socially and politically and emotionally. And she said, yeah, penis envy, ha. Y'all got womb envy and you're just rationalizing. If you remember that defense mechanism of rationalization, you're taking the way it is and rationalizing it so that women are subserving it to men. But what in fact is the case here is y'all are jealous of women, so you use your power to then control them indirectly. So you control the womb indirectly. Interestingly enough, not coming down one way or the other for you. You pick where you want to on anything. But when you look at reproductive laws and reproductive women's health issues, who's usually talking the loudest about them? Men. They don't have a womb. But they got a lot to say about it. And they used to control every aspect of females in society. That's breaking down as would be predicted by Karen Horney's idea that once you start realizing that it's not all about guys, uh, it's about people and understanding how she functioned to stay a psychoanalytic theorist but yet revise pretty profoundly Freud's views, you see that they're amenable to change. They're, in other words, open to question. And if you question them, and you start looking at some of the other researchers, many of whom were women psychologists and psychologists of color, who started challenging all of these dominant stereotypes with data, the stereotypes don't hold up.